Now that we've covered the functions of the circulatory system, let's take a closer look at the components. There are three main components to the circulatory system. We have the blood, the blood vessels, which hold the blood, and the heart, which moves the blood around. We're actually going to do a separate unit on each of those three um, components of the circulatory system. And we're going to start with the blood. If we look carefully at the blood, so here you can see someone getting their blood drawn. And this is what blood looks like when it goes into a tube. You can see that it's all red. If you let the blood sit, or if you spin it in a centrifuge, it separates into three specific layers. We have the liquid part of the blood, called the plasma. This typically is going to be about 55% of the blood volume is the plasma, or the liquid part. And the rest of the blood is made up of what we call the formed elements. The most common formed element is the erythrocytes, or red blood cells, which we can see at the bottom of the tube. And then, in a small layer in between the plasma and the erythrocytes, we see the leukocytes mixed up with the platelets. We can see the different types of formed elements more clearly if we take a look under a microscope. When you look at a microscope slide showing blood, this one's been stained so that we can see the formed elements more easily since they would usually not be so dark. Most of what we see are round pink cells. These round pink cells are the erythrocytes, or the red blood cells. Erythrocytes, or red blood cells, are important because they carry the oxygen. They contain the hemoglobin that binds to oxygen to carry the oxygen from your lungs out to the rest of your body. The larger cells that stay in a darker purple, like here and here, are the leukocytes, or the white blood cells, which we already mentioned are an important part of the immune system for fighting disease and protecting the body from other harmful substances. The smallest of the formed elements are not even true cells, they're really just cell fragments, and those are the platelets. And the platelets show up on a microscope slide as small purple dots. So here we have a few platelets in this slide. Platelets are important because platelets are needed for blood clotting, and that keeps you from bleeding so that you don't die every time you cut yourself. Let's take a look at some of the properties of blood that are important for its function. The first one is blood volume. The volume of blood in a normal healthy adult is somewhere between four and six liters of blood. This varies based on a number of different factors, one of the most important being size. Large people are going to have more blood than small people. Being a relatively small person, my blood volume is probably closer to the four liter range whereas someone who's much taller or bigger would be more towards the six liter range of that average blood volume. Other things that can affect the blood volume include uh, your level of hydration. If you're well hydrated, you'll have a higher blood volume than if you're dehydrated. Um, your age, the older you get, the lower your blood volume tends to be. Um, your level of activity, um, your level of health, uh, altitude, diet, uh, even the season of the year can have an effect on what's going on with your blood volume. So there are lots of different things that affect blood volume, but it should stay somewhere in that four to six liter range. The second thing that's important about blood is its viscosity. Viscosity um, refers to the thickness of the blood, or more accurately, viscosity means resistance to flow. Blood, as they say, really is thicker than water. Blood is four to five times more viscous than water is. And this is important for how the blood flows through the body. If the blood is too thin, then it doesn't support all of the structures suspended in the blood and all your blood cells would fall to the bottom and then they wouldn't stay suspended in the liquid. If your blood is too thick, it puts a lot of strain on your heart to try to push it around your body. So it's important that blood viscosity remain in the appropriate range. There are two important things that contribute to the viscosity of the blood. One are the blood cells themselves. The more blood cells you have in your blood, the higher the viscosity of your blood is going to be. The other are the proteins and other things that are dissolved in the plasma of the blood. The more protein you have in your blood plasma, the more viscous your blood is going to be. One of the most difficulties of the properties of blood to wrap your head around is the osmolarity. The osmolarity refers to the amount of stuff dissolved in the blood. 
And the osmolarity is important because it affects osmosis. It affects the movement of water. There are two things to keep in mind when we're talking about the osmolarity. One is the overall osmolarity. This is all the things that are dissolved in the blood. Little things like glucose and sodium and amino acids, especially ions like sodium because they are in greatest quantities and so they have the biggest effect on the overall osmolarity. And then there's the colloid osmolarity. And this refers specifically to the concentration of big things in the blood. Big things like proteins that stay in the blood vessels and can't get out to go out into the tissues. The colloid osmolarity is particularly important because of the way it affects the movement of water between the blood vessels and the tissues. It's important that things are able to move from the blood vessels into the tissues and from the tissues into the blood vessels. And that process is called capillary dynamics. And I want to take a closer look at what's going on with capillary dynamics. Let me draw you a picture. Here we have a capillary. Capillaries are very tiny structures the wall of the capillary is only one cell thick. So this capillary wall will be made of a single layer of cells. And there are some small gaps between these cells. Material that's getting in and out of the capillaries has to be able to fit through these tiny gaps between the capillary cells. Inside the capillary is where we find the blood. The blood includes red blood cells, as well as white blood cells and platelets that I'm not going to add to my drawing so it doesn't get too cluttered. And then we have all of this stuff that's dissolved in the blood. We have lots of very small molecules. These small molecules would be things like glucose and amino acids and especially sodium and other ions. And then we also have a number of larger things inside the blood vessels. And those would be proteins that are dissolved in the plasma. When we're talking about how water and dissolved molecules get out of capillaries, the force that pushes water and molecules out of the capillaries is called the hydrostatic pressure. And that's just the pressure of the blood in the capillary. The blood pressure pushes fluid and small molecules out of the capillary through those gaps between the cells. So the hydrostatic pressure pushes water and small molecules out. So we have approximately the same concentration of small molecules outside the cell in the interstitial fluid as we do inside the capillary in the blood. Now we have to have a way to get the fluid that's pushed out of the capillary back into the capillary again. Otherwise we would keep pushing more and more fluid out and we would get more and more fluid in the tissues and we would swell up like crazy. So there's got to be a mechanism to get the fluid back into the blood vessels. And that is the osmotic pressure. Specifically, the colloid osmotic pressure. Water moves by osmosis from areas with lower concentrations to areas of higher concentrations. Water always wants to go where there's more stuff. And there's a lot more stuff inside the capillary than there is outside. So water is being pulled by osmosis into the capillaries. This is really important because the last thing we want is to have the hydrostatic pressure pushing tons of fluid out into the, out into the interstitial compartment with no way to get the water back into the blood. If that happened, if we pushed water out of the capillaries into the tissues all the time, we would all swell up like crazy if there was no way to pull that water back into the blood vessels again. And that's what the proteins in the blood do for us. They contribute to the colloid osmotic pressure that pulls fluid from the tissues back into the blood vessels again. 
We can get the best idea of how important the osmolarity and the colloid pressure are when we consider what happens when they're either too high or too low. Let's start with the overall osmolarity, which depends mostly on the concentration of the small molecules in the blood. Now, if the concentration of the small molecules is high, that's going to give us high osmolarity. That's going to give us a lot of stuff in the blood vessels, as well as a lot of stuff in the tissue fluid. This is going to retain a lot of water in the body overall. We're going to have more water attracted into the tissues and more water attracted into the blood vessels. That raises the blood volume, it raises the blood pressure, it raises the amount of fluid in the tissues which could cause swelling or edema. On the other hand, if we look at what happens if we have a high colloid osmotic pressure, that would be due to a high concentration of large things, big proteins, that are only found inside the capillary, then we can see that more water is attracted into the capillaries. So we will have more water in the capillaries that raises the blood volume and raises the blood pressure, but we're not going to see swelling because all these extra proteins inside the capillary pull water from the tissues into the capillaries. So we'll see a lot of water moving out of the tissues and into the capillaries to raise the blood pressure without causing swelling.